The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's, to today's webinar, an introduction to state aid in New York State. My name is Matthew Darius. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator here at ASCO, and I'll be moderating today's program. Your presenters for today's program are Andrea Hyrie and Bruce Jezielowski from the Office of State Aid at the New York State Education Department. If you are listening to the webinar over the phone today and would like to speak to our presenters, please press the raise hand button on your GoToWebinar control panel and wait until I call your name. If you are listening over the computer, many of you are, you will need a microphone installed on your PC in order to speak. If you do not have a microphone or you prefer to type your question, you can do so by typing into the chat window or using the Ask Question function, which is a button on your GoToWebinar control panel, and then typing in whatever your comment or question is. Uh, now that we have the basics out of the way, uh, Bruce and Andrea, please begin. Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Um, hoping that uh, this is Andrea Hayari from the State Aid Office. Um, hoping that uh, this crowd is uh, relatively new to the State Aid world, because this is a very basic presentation. Um, first, we're going to cover some real nuts and bolts uh, components uh, of State Aid. Uh, then we're going to, in part two, we're going to talk about um, uh, the timeline of state aid, to give you some insight into the state aid cycle. Um, and actually, that portion of the presentation is uh, w one of the things that you that that would be harder for you to get elsewhere. We do have some resources for you to look further into aid formulas uh, uh, and the like, but uh, this uh, timeline and uh, cycle stuff is um, uh, hard to get all in one place, so we're going to spend some time on that. Uh, then we are going to uh, uh, give you some information about how to learn more about the formulas, some resources on our website and other places. Um, Bruce is going to talk about the um, output reports. Uh, that we uh, are our primary uh, vehicle for calculating aid and showing you how much aid you get. And then we'll provide some uh, tips for uh, you so that you can take some action uh, uh, to ensure that the aid that you're getting is correct and that you receive it, uh, receive the payments in a timely manner. I think this is kind of an interesting place to start. It's a little quote from our, our state constitution. It says that the legislature shall provide for the maintenance and support of a system of free common schools wherein all the children of this state may be educated. Uh, and the point I like to make from that quote is that um, the legislature is providing this support and that it's for all the children and what we take from that and the way state aid actually plays out is that everybody gets something, regardless of their ability to raise revenue locally, uh, that education, the cost of education, is truly a shared local and state responsibility. In our state, the state pays roughly 40% of the total cost of education. We have a relatively high local share at 52% and 8% federal, and that federal is relatively high right now compared to, to years ago uh, because of the uh, stimulus uh, monies that have been coming in. Uh, before that, it was probably closer to 4 or 5%. Um, other states have higher state shares. Other states have lower state shares. Um, we've been hovering around 40% or a little higher for, for many years now in New York State. Uh, if you're interested in actually the uh, source of those revenues, the more information about the local levy and um, where the state funding comes from, uh, the state aid primer that we're going to refer to later has, uh, has information like that. I picked one uh, key concept 
for state aid because it uh, really applies almost across the board, certainly in terms of the proportion of state aid that's allocated uh, based on this concept, uh, it, it, it's very high and, and I think worth going over in some detail and, and trying to relate a little bit to what you're eventually going to see on your output reports. And that concept is wealth equalization. And the idea is that the goal, one of the goals of the state paying aid is to equalize your revenues by providing state aid in inverse proportion to each school district's ability to raise revenues uh, locally for education. In inverse proportion. So the wealthier uh, a, a school district community is in terms, we use usually terms of full value behind each pupil or income behind each pupil, theoretically and actually the less state support they should receive. And we measure this, we calculate and measure this uh, local fiscal capacity for state aid purposes anyway with things called wealth ratios. Many, many formulas, many of our aid formulas use the wealth ratios. Uh, typically, uh, they are based on uh, full value or actual value per pupil in a school district compared to the state average full value per pupil, or sometimes a combination of that and uh, adjusted gross income per pupil compared to the state average adjusted gross income per pupil. So the higher your wealth ratio, the wealthier you are in relation to the state average, and the less state aid you would receive. Uh, and some of our major aids are, uh, incorporate this wealth ratio concept. Uh, building aid, transportation aid, BOCES aid. At the beginning of all the output reports for those aids, you will see, or somewhere in the output report, you will see the calculation of an aid ratio that will start with the calculation of a wealth ratio. You'll see full value and then you'll see a denominator pupil count. The pupil count may vary, but it's the same concept each time you see the calculation of an aid ratio. So once we've determined the wealth ratio, whether it's full value per our WADA or a combined wealth ratio, then we turn around and say, well, okay, what's the aid ratio? Typically these formulas are uh, uh, wealth equalized formulas multiply a dollar amount, whether it's an approved expense, uh, by a state share ratio or an aid ratio. So often on your output reports you'll see uh, an aid ratio, you'll see something like one minus and then you'll see the combined wealth ratio, which is the wealth ratio, and then what's remaining is the state share. So if you're uh, just a generic example, if your wealth ratio is 90% uh, of the state average, your aid ratio could be 1 minus 90% or 10%. The concept being the higher the wealth ratio, the lower the aid ratio, and vice versa. Of course, Anyone who's had any exposure to state aid knows that despite this equalizing principle, wealth equalization principle, there remain tremendous funding disparities among New York State school districts. And because the local revenue is such a large portion of total revenue for education, one would say that those disparities are primarily due to the variation in local fiscal capacity. We know that the business folks in school districts are extremely busy and uh, state aid is extremely complex. But I thought I would just mention that um, the combination of foundation aid and these four 
uh, expense-based aids that are listed here account for over 90% of the total state formula aids that we administer in this office. So from a, a using your resources, your time resources uh, uh, perspective or risk management perspective, um, if you do decide to spend some time uh, learning more about state aid, this is where the big bucks are. Um, these are also the most complex formulas. They have the most moving parts and uh, have the most uh, raw data items involved in them, so uh, there's that trend. Although we pride ourselves on doing everything correctly the first time, <laughs> they are also the formulas that um, where there would most likely be uh, a, a problem that would uh, arise. Um, so again, if you uh, Want to if you have limited time and you want to focus on uh, anything in particular, these are the these are the ones to go to. <clears throat> these days, since Foundation Aid came in in 2007-8, uh, Foundation Aid is now the um, primary what we call general purpose operating aid formula really no restrictions on how you use that money at all uh, for your general operating expenses. And at an extremely simplistic level, uh, distilling what's probably a 10-page output report for foundation aid, um, foundation aid takes a, an amount per pupil representing some sort of adjusted ideal expense per pupil for an adequate education, subtracts a calculated local contribution, that's foundation amount per pupil minus local contribution, and then multiplies that times uh, a pupil count to get you your total foundation aid. And if you'll see tucked in here to that second bullet under foundation aid, where it says the greater of $500 per pupil or the calculation I just, the simple calculation I just described to you, that $500 per pupil, that's called a flat grant. And that goes back to the first slide that we talked about where the state constitution says that uh, education is really a shared state and local responsibility. And the way that translates into money in foundation aid is that any school district, regardless how wealthy they are, what their local fiscal capacity is, gets at least $500 per pupil in foundation aid. Then we have what I've already referred to as our expense-based aids, and that's a very uh, common term. And those are primarily aids that are primarily calculated from um, reported or claimed expenses uh, and, and approved expenses. Um, the difference between claimed expenses and approved expenses being that you may have spent uh, $500,000 on something, but the state law for a particular formula says, yes, but before you aid that expense, you need to deduct X, Y, and Z. So your approved expenses for aid are only, let's say, $300,000. Um, and expense-based aid generally apply an aid ratio to an expense amount. Then we have just a handful uh, in recent years of uh, flat grant aids, and the simplest example of that would be your uh, some of your instructional materials aids, where it's a, a dollar amount for, per pupil times a pupil count with no wealth equalization or anything like that, and that we refer to also as a a flat grant per pupil. And uh, not much of the money that you receive is uh, comes to you that way. Most of it is in foundation aid and wealth equalized expense based aids. Um, the uh, state aid primer that we will refer to later has in its appendix 
a list of uh, all of the 2012-13 formula aids uh, in Appendix A of the uh, State Aid Primer, and also the State Aid Handbook has uh, a full listing of the aids if you wanted to flip through that. We're at about 15 to 20 aid formulas these days, depending on what you call the true formula. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute to talk about the payment side. Uh, these aids are not paid separately. You don't get a building aid check and a transportation check uh, and a foundation aid check. Um, and they're not all paid according to the same schedule. We have three, we have several different payments that we make, but three main payment schedules. The general aid schedule, the BOCES aid schedule, and the excess cost aid schedule. Private excess cost, special education aid, and public excess high cost aid. Those are the three major payment categories. Each has its own schedule. And the schedule, the payment schedule throughout the age year can also vary across districts based on various uh, fiscal factors unique to a district. We actually have a whole uh, separate payment unit in the Office of Education Finance that, um, that handles payments. And uh, you may want to make a note if you want to read a, a nice summary of those payment schedules, uh, section uh, four of the state aid handbook that we're going to refer to later. Uh, toward the end of the handbook uh, goes over those payment schedules, contains the details of those payment schedules. And general aid is the biggest one, and that includes your foundation aid, your building aid, transportation aid, and many other aids. And of course, we have the gap elimination adjustment, the GEA, um, which in recent years, it's been called a few different things over the past several years, but since the fiscal crisis uh, hit, it's uh, been essentially a mechanism to reduce your state aid, but after it's, rather than change each formula to um, reduce the total aid to bring it more in line with what the state wants to spend on state aid, they let the formulas flow and then implement this reduction after the fact, which has its own set of formulas. Um, and, and the amount is subtracted from your general aid. Um, that we have an output report uh, that will be coming out in the fall uh, just containing that calculation uh, in a simplistic way. Uh, if you want to see the details of that calculation for 2012-13, the best place to look is in the uh, description of the um, uh, state aid budget computer run, or also our state aid handbook, 1213 state aid handbook, section three, has uh, a description of, a full description of the gap elimination adjustment formula. We're going to move on to Section 2, which is all about timelines and the state aid cycle. Um, all of what we do in this office uh, is based on law and regulation, mostly education law. Some of our formula stuff is in other sections of, uh, of state law. But it's all based on uh, black and white at least we try and do our best to interpret it as black and white in, in, in education law and in state law and in commissioner's regulations. Um, the, the legislature creates those laws uh, and the Board of Regents enacts sometimes regulations to further clarify those laws. Um, but the process starts with an exec in most year in in normal years with an executive budget proposal. That's the governor's also referred to as the governor's proposal. 
Um, it's published usually in January so that, for example, this year proposals for 2013-14 aid will come out in the executive budget proposal in January 2013. Well, where do they get those numbers from? Those numbers are a combination of the district, your data that you've provided to us in this fall as of a date very soon in November, like tomorrow or the next day, where we freeze a file that contains all the data that you've provided to us uh, via SAMS or, and your building project data and other sources. It's a combination, the executive budget proposals are a combination of that data and applied to that whatever the executive or the governor is proposing to alter regarding the state aid laws for next year. So they don't do a clean slate every year and start from scratch. They do most years just kind of tweaking of, of what's already in existence. So it's important to remember that those numbers that come out in January, that's a proposal. It is not necessarily what you're going to get. And it's not necessarily even the law that's going to be enacted since that executive budget proposal starts the whole process where then there's negotiations between the executive and the legislature and ultimately the legislature enacts what the changes will be. And that usually ideally happens before the start of the new state fiscal year uh, before April 1. Um, we've had years that the state budget was very, very late, August, July, um, but it has been on time for several years now. The uh, executive, um, I'm sorry, the uh, state budget that's enacted in the spring, the data that those projections are based on comes from, again, your district data, but this time from a file that's frozen in February 15th. So with the executive, you see numbers in January based on November data, and when the budget's passed, you see numbers uh, for projections based on data that was on file with us in February. For both the executive proposal and the uh, enacted budget, we post summary listings of both current year and the projected year formula aids on our website, and we mail to the superintendent detailed uh, aid and projection totals and formula descriptions and the backup data, what we call backup data for those calculations. Those are mailed to the school superintendent. Um, it, this is in red just as a little note here because uh, it seems that sometimes those materials don't make their way from the superintendent to the state, what we call the state aid designee, the person you tell us in your district we're supposed to talk to regarding state aid matters. So you do want to look out for those um, you know, within several days <clears throat> after the executive budget is released and after the budget is enacted and obtain those materials for your review. We don't tell you to do this. We never tell you to do this. But I can tell you that um, it's possible that the executive, because of the timing of these things, this cycle that I've been describing, that the executive budget proposal may be the best estimate of your aid for the coming year. And you may use that uh, to factor into your school district budget development in early spring. Um, again, it's a proposal. It's based on estimated data. And it's a proposal in the sense that we don't even know if that's what's going to be enacted. But again, if all you have, I don't know if it's the best or not, it's all you have going into your budget process uh, and, and the accuracy of that day, that those projections is going to be based on what the legislature actually enacts, how much that differs from the executive proposal, and also 
on the accuracy and currency of the projections that you provided and that the BOCES provided uh, on which those proposals were based. So this is where we make our pitch for you to focus on your uh, aid and projection data in SAMS um, so that those projections uh, can serve the purposes they're supposed to serve, which is eventually to tell you, give you a good estimate of the aid coming to you in the following, the current year and the following year, and also for us to give the state a good projection statewide of what things are going to look like. In addition to reporting the accurate data, it's important to be aware of a whole slew of timelines and deadlines for multiple submissions, not just SAM, that can actually impact what's included in that November 15th data file that's the basis for the executive proposal. So more than just SAM's data flows into that file, and the things that flow into that file do so on multiple schedules. Okay, so how does it trans how does all this translate into what we do in our office? The executive proposals, projections, the numbers that you see and the enacted projections, those are modeled on a system that's actually not even part of the state aid office. It's, it's another unit of the education finance office. So after they pass the state budget, then this office, in our office, we essentially recreate those aid calculations in SAMS, and the ones that we create in SAMS are the calculations that are the basis for your state aid payments. So to calculate your current year aid, we collect your claim and projection data from districts and from BOCES via SAMS, and the BOCES have their own version of SAMS for the past few years. And we throw in data from a bunch of other sources, other agencies, other SED offices, for example, STAC and transportation contract office and bus purchase forms, a whole bunch of stuff we use to calculate your current year aid. Um, and the SAMS portion of that, of course, is, is due on September 2nd of each summer. It takes us between September and now, essentially, today, <laughs> tomorrow, uh, to um, uh, look at the 700 school district claims, and each district submits four form sets and all the 37 BOCES claims, and to program and correct and check uh, all of the aid calculations. So. We usually don't release the output reports showing you your current year aid calculations until around now or a little earlier some years and a little later other years, depending on whether it's a rough year for us or not because of various things that might be going on. Um, and, and at first, those output reports are made available to you within your SAM software. So there's two, I think sometimes I, when I talk to districts, they, especially ones who've been around for a while because it kind of worked differently before, but um, th there's essentially two views. When we tell you we've released SAMS output reports in SAMS, you can go in and view them in your software, but the world, the taxpayers, the community, everybody else can't see them. Only you can see your own. Then later on, when we're really sure everything's fine and when they're all done and after the November database has been provided to the Division of the Budget and the legislature, usually we wait for that, then we put them on our website and, and then they're accessible by the general public via the Internet. So it's really two separate releases.
if you only ever look at one thing on our website, I would recommend that it be the state aid calendar of deadlines. Um, it's been around for a few years now, um, and it's quite comprehensive, and it, uh, it really in, puts in one place the most critical things you need to know about state aid. It's got fixed deadlines in it, and it's got something called uh, rolling deadlines in it. And what we mean by rolling deadlines as opposed to fixed deadlines are, for example, your uh, final cost reports for your capital project would be a rolling deadline because the due date for your final cost report depends on your project, unlike SAM's data, which is due for all the districts on September 2nd. So it's got actually two, sec two separate sections for those two kinds of deadlines. Um, and really and truly, I, I mean, I, I never quite know what folks are looking for when they say they want to hear about how to maximize state aid. I mean, the law is the law and the data is the data. If the data is good, then the aid is correct. But from our point of view here and those of us who've been here many years and had to wince so many times when people lose money because they miss deadlines, that really uh, one of the biggest parts of maximizing state aid from our perspective is not to lose any aid because of missed deadlines. And here's a list of, off the top of my head, what seem like the most critical ones to me. Um, in particular, the final cost reports for capital projects um, that were approved before July 1, 2011. Um, there's a special amnesty that was enacted last year, so if you've got a late final cost report and you get it in by December 31st of this year, you will not lose all the building aid on that project. You will only lose the building aid on that project for the number of years that the report was delinquent. But once that deadline, that 1231 amnesty ends, still for projects approved before 7111, then you're back to if you uh, submit a late final cost report, you lose all the building aid on the project. Um, and that's not pretty. So, and then you've got here, uh, I've listed a few other uh, of the deadlines. Um, just to call your attention that June 30th is what we call our statute of limitations. Essentially, uh, for example, if you've got a transportation expense on this year's SAM claim, on 11-12 transportation expense for 12-13 transportation aid, you can change that expense as many times as you'd like, as much as you like, between now and June 30th, 2013. And after that, if you make a change that increases your transportation aid, you won't get it paid in this current year aid as 12-13 aid. Um, you'll still get it if you uh, submit the change within the next school year, in other words, before June 30th, 2014. But if you submit it after June 30th, 2013, it will go on our infamous prior year queue, um, which is a long list of uh, adjustments to aid um, that are waiting in line to be paid for waiting in line for several years to be paid to school districts, and the reason they wait in line is because we're only given uh, a small amount of money each year. I think it was 15 million this year to to draw to whittle down uh, that uh, list of prior year adjustments. So we pay which uh, however many we can uh, until the money runs out, and then we wait for the allocation for next year to pay it down. So. If you need to make changes to your claim, it's a good idea to do it before June 30th uh, of the age year that you're making the claim for. Okay. That concludes part two. Yes, that concludes part two. Okay. Okay. You're I'd gonna... like to take over at part three. Yep. This is Bruce Jezolowski, and he's going to continue 
the rest of the presentation. Do you want to drive the slides for me? Okay. I'll just follow along. Part three, how to learn more about state aid formulas. There's basically four areas that I think are useful for learning more about state aid formulas. Uh, the first one being uh, access to the education law. Another resource, as Andrea pointed out earlier, the state aid primer. The third being the state aid handbook. And the fourth being output reports. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the education law. The education law sets the basics and sets actually not the basics, it sets in place the formulas for each of the eight categories. I, in my web browser, I bookmarked, and in our uh, slide, you'll see the assembly website. And from the assembly website, you can actually bring up all the New York State laws. From that website, the section that I'm usually most interested in is the education law. And then within the education law, most of our aid formulas come under 30, Section 3602. Another important piece that I didn't mention in the four primaries is also the regulations. The regulations also uh, dictate sometimes how the formulas are calculated. This isn't a plug for Westlaw, but uh, I generally use Westlaw software to find regulations. You probably can go and surf the web or go to our New York State website to find some regulations, but they're a little bit more difficult to find in one, uh, one location. That's why I think it's probably best if you have some sort of uh, software to do that. And again, I use Westlaw, but that's not really a plug for them the one I use. Bump ahead on slide. The state aid primer. The state aid primer is broken into two sections. The first being school finance in New York State. This is an interesting section and I think it's very useful for business officials to read it because it goes into a lot of the basic concepts that Andrea talked about in her earlier sections about wealth equalization, about aid ratios, and the concept of the inverse proportion if you're a wealthy district uh, and your aid ratio is lower. So it's a, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a nice place to go and, and get that overview. The primer is an annual publication. It publishes the key school aid concepts, and also the impact of new legislation. The primer also has a section, section two, that is broken down into six or seven sections, goes into the purpose of state aid, key concepts, talks about the state support in 1213, local support, components of school finance, it also has a detailed section for foundation aid. And it also has a section of uh, selected expense-based aids, such as building aid, trans aid, BOCES aid, public and private, excess cost aid. As you go through the primer and you read it, and then you move on to the state aid handbook, some of it is redundant, but I think it's useful to read and be familiar with both because the, the more you can read and understand, it, it just gives you a better foundation. And then when you move on to the output reports, it will give you a better understanding of how the formulas and the math actually work. State Aid Handbook. State Aid Handbook, again, it's an annual publication. It provides a plain language narrative 
and the actual mathematical calculations for the state aid formulas for the current year. It starts off, if you're familiar with it, the summary of the, the enacted changes, and then it goes through every single state aid formula and provides a narrative. At the top of the section, it also gives a statutory reference, which is really useful because you can go back to the assembly website that I mentioned earlier, actually click on the section, the subsection, print the actual language, and follow it through. And again, I do that routinely every year when the budget passes. You can see the enacted language, what sections, and then go to the assembly webpage. Usually within a few weeks after the enacted budget, you'll see the updates to the law. The, uh, the state aid handbook also uh, has a section, as Andrea mentioned earlier, the payment schedules. And that's another great section to be familiar with because it, it actually, it'll tell you when you're supposed to get money throughout the year. And I know we get a lot of calls throughout the year as to what these a district's getting a check and they, they want to try to understand what this check is for. And unfortunately, a lot of the payments are kind of bundled together so they're not actually a specific, like a payment can't be exactly identified to a transportation aid. They're more bundled payments that are based on the payment schedule. Uh, so it, you, it, it's a good idea to be familiar with when these payments are actually coming to you and what they represent. For instance, uh, during the year when you get to June, you might only be getting a certain percentage of your public excess cost aid paid to you. So if you go to the output report, you might see $50,000, but your payment might be only $25,000. And then again, the output reports, uh, those payments are again based on possibly snapshots of the output report. So you'll see an output report with maybe $75,000 worth of aid, but your payment was based on a May snapshot that might have only had 50000 of aid. So it's, it's important to know what the payment schedules, how they're set, and what databases and snapshots they're using as well. The State Aid Handbook also has a very useful glossary and an, a, that would be Appendix A, where it goes through all the lingo and state aid terms. There's also an Appendix B that has all the acronyms. When I first came to state aid, I was amazed by all the acronyms. And, and I was somebody who came from the military where we had a lot of acronyms. And we even have more acronyms here. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good resource as well. Nice. Uh, listing of all of our acronyms. And on my handout, on my slide, I have the web address for the Primer, the State Aid Handbook as well. Next section, the next resource, something that uh, I'm very close to the state aid output reports. Over most of my career at state aid, I've worked in, uh, closely with the state aid output reports. It's important to be familiar with the output reports, go through them, uh, look at the calculations. As we say in our slide, there's no easy way to learn the formulas. You just really have to work through them, understand the math. And the math is, is usually pretty simple math. It's adding and subtracting, multiplying and dividing. It's not very heavy math. It's just complex where all the pieces are coming from. So as you go through an output report, we, we have them laid out and detailed, I think, enough that you should be able to follow through and trace it, all the pieces where they're coming from. Uh, but it does take some time and effort to do that. 
if you need assistance, we're, we're always here. Please give us a call. Uh, currently, we have 12 output reports for 2012-13 that are available in SAMS for business officials to view uh, after you log in. They're not yet public, but they're out there for viewing purposes, and we can go into those a little bit further on. When you log into SAM as a business official and you go to the state aid menu for the output reports, you click on the menu, it should drop down. As you click on each output report that's available to you, you'll see the status. For you to see it, you it either has to be official or official and public. And what official means is if it's only designated as official, that means you can only view it when you're logged in as a user and you can only view your own reports. It's not yet available on the website on, via our state aid website interface. It's only available as, as a logged in participant of SAMS. One other thing when you're in the SAMS output reports that's very uh, important to note, you can actually select various data areas to run those official reports against. The default, I believe, is it's going to run against your official data area, but then you can go into your dropdown and districts should have an official area they should have a revision area and a sandbox area. All of the calculations on the output report are using official data. If your claim reports aren't all in and complete, the output might not be valid. For instance, if your transportation form FT is not in and you click on your transportation output report, you might not see transaid or you may see minimal aid or you may see expense items that are coming through other ancillary systems that feed into SAMS. For instance, you may see bus purchase data there on your expense line, but you might not see some of the Schedule I or Schedule H uh, data expenses. The next, the next echelon up, if you will, from an official output report is what we call public and official. What that means is we have released it to go to the web, report, the web output reports. So if you go to our state aid homepage and you go through the interface, you can basically key in and log in to any district code in the upper left hand corner of the web page and access anybody's output reports that are out there and public as long as their data set has been sent to us and it's clean and accepted into SAMS as official data. One other thing to note that when you look at a public output report, it's current as of midnight the night before, whereas when you're logged in as a SAMS user and you're looking at those output reports in your interface area, you're going to be looking at it most probably as current data. Whatever you're signed in as, that date time is coming through as official data in your public reports, but where you're official. But public reports are always as of the night before. And again, public can be seen by anybody. So it's important to review your output reports for accuracy to make sure that they're out there for the public and it, you, know, you want to make sure that what the public is seeing is accurate and complete. As we understand output reports and you can become familiar with them, I did mention we had 
three data areas. When we talk about the efficient, official data area, it, it's really not the, the exact same term as the official output report. The official output report that I noted before was just that it's official release to the SAMS user to view. Official data area means your data was submitted to us, we reviewed it, we looked at the edits, and we determined that it was acceptable to be released into SAMS as official valid data, and then that data can be used for payment and projection purposes. So in, until we say it's, until we deem it good enough, it does not get to the official data area. But you can see it. When you're logged in, you'll see whatever you submit it uh, as your claim form. After you have an official data set, data area, accepted into SAMS, any changes that you need to make to that data area, the official data area, has to be submitted through the re revision data area. So you would log into SAMS on your drop-down, go to your revision data area, make your changes. It's always Im important also after you make changes to run your edit reports in the revision data area. Review your change summary report and then submit that claim to us, the revision claim. Again, we look at the revision data, we look at the edit reports, we look at the explanations if there are any posted. Then we accept that data, that revision data, and once we accept it, it then moves from the revision data area to the official data area. So if you then, once we do that, if you go into your revision data area, you won't see that anymore. It moves all over to your official. The other important area for you, for business officials to use and kind of work with, and I think it's a really great feature in SANS, is something we call Sandbox. You can go into your Sandbox area, go in, click on Sandbox, go to any claim form, make changes, and then see how those changes flow through to the output report. But to do that, you have to make a change in Sandbox, then go to the output report area and select Sandbox. Okay, it's, then you can do that as many times as you want. You can change whatever data you want it doesn't get its way into revision, it doesn't get its way into official, it's just for you to go and play around in and, and use as a tool. And we can use it too. I mean, any, once you're in there, anybody can go in and change it, so it's really not a lockdown area. Uh, the other important thing to note is, let's say you're in Sandbox and you're making all these changes, and you want to try to undo them, or you, they're just there and you don't want them anymore, you can go to your change summary screen, and there's a button that says clear entire sandbox. So you can click on that button, clear out your sandbox, and it resets it to the official data area. Okay, but it doesn't change any data area, it just resets it for you to go and then do any type of what-if situations you want to do in Sandbox. Yeah. So it's a, very, it's a very nice feature, and it's powerful because you can see the changes right away on output reports and on claim forms. Another, I think, terrific feature of SAMS is something we call SAMS Snapshot. When you're logged into SAMS, you click on the drop-down for output reports. At the top of the output report selection screen, 
you should have an interface that lets you uh, see a drop-down menu for snapshots. And throughout the year, we create snapshots of various uh, data files. And in the slide, you'll see I listed uh, ones that we generally make available. The first one being the November 15th data. And this is the data set that the governor will use to build his executive budget. So in January, when the budget comes out and you say, well, I didn't know, how did the trans aid get to that of, of, uh, number? You can actually go on a snapshot and see exactly what you sent in for your claim, your base year and your projection year. And we can see it too. So uh, if you need to call us and kind of have a conversation with us, you and you at your end and us at our end, we can click on that snapshot and see the same data. So it, it's a very it's a very nice tool because in years before before this, we would have to have hard copy in front of us and hope that you would have the same hard copy at your end. So it was very cumbersome. Now it's it's very powerful. You can bring up a snapshot and do that. All the claim detail, all the aid calculations, everything. It runs against the claim set and the output report. Some of the other snapshots that are very, uh, very nice to have and important, December 1, that's the data file that freezes your general aid payments through May. Then the May database, we use the May database to then pay, make the June payments. We also, the last couple years, instituted something so that we would save a couple forests. We no longer print and send out to all districts the public and private excess cost aid output reports. We create a SAM snapshot, and I believe in, in last year and the year before, we labeled it stack update. Last year, the report was dated January 10th. The year before that, I believe it was January 31st. But we've synced up with the stack office to create that extract that we publish. And then not, not unlike any other year before that, if you review those output reports and feel that you have data areas that, uh, or data errors or holes that need to be filled because stack records aren't coming through, we would first ask that you call the stack office to make sure that your claims were submitted properly. And then after, if they are and there's other issues, typically the stack office communicates those areas to me and we resolve any inconsistencies. Student level data for the, for the stack updates, you'll see that we just push out the public and private output report and it's the, the high cost data, for instance, is an aggregate number. The student level data, the details, you would have to get in touch with Stack. Ed Truax in the Stack office, I believe they also, at the same time we create the Stack Update snapshot, they create a detailed report of all the student level data that generates the high cost. In years gone by, we used to mail out all that detail to you. Uh, Ed Truax and company, they should have that detail uh, available for you. We also have a few other snapshots. February 15th, that's a very important one that is used for the enacted budget. May 15th for the June payment, August 15th for the final September payment. All these snapshots are very important, very critical uh, in what they're used for. It's a good idea to go out there and, and take a look when those key snapshots are put in place. And, and uh, if you do see anything that looks odd, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. Navigating the output reports, 
As I mentioned earlier, the output reports are fairly straightforward. They seem complex. They seem overwhelming sometimes. But if you really kind of slowly go through them, they're laid out all in the same consistent manner. They have a plain, uh, hopefully a plain English to somewhat uh, description. They have a source column and then a calculated amount. The source column, it's either a straightforward reference to where the item is being pulled from. For instance, the GEN report is a summary report that shows all the GEN aids and then calculates some totals for payment purposes. And there's some other categories within the GEN that we roll up and, and calculate some wealth parameters. But generally, the general aids output report on the first page, it references other output reports where the totals are pulled from. For instance, the TRA and the building aid, those total aid amounts are actually calculated on other output reports. The output reports also in the source column, if they're not a direct reference to a output, another output report, they show the actual calculation being made at that entry. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to call our office, either the program area, or if you have other questions, uh, I'm usually available. But I would ask that you first call the program areas, for instance, the building unit or the transportation unit or the uh, attendance unit if you have questions regarding individual calculations. When to check the output reports. Anytime you submit, well, first of all, once they're available, it's important to check them. So typically, mid to late October, we start publishing output reports. And up through December 1st, when we create the first December 1st payment schedule, all of the critical current year output reports are typically published and viewable by districts. So it's important to look at the output reports during that time. Also, it's important to look at output reports any time you send in a SAMS revision that you think is going to impact aid. For instance, if you submit a Form FT revision and you know it's current year expenses, or actually prior year expenses, it should impact current year aid. So you want to make sure that uh, you're looking for those changes to come through. If you think you, if you know you've submitted a lot of stack revision and those stack revisions, for instance, 11, 12 stack were submitted, they would impact your 12-13 private or public excess cost aid. You would want to go to your output reports to check to see if the data flowed through. Generally speaking, we do updates to the stack records about the 20th of each month. So I would look at the end of each month to see that the stack updates that you've submitted clear through our system and are showing up on your output reports. As I have here in the bullet, you want to, uh, November 15th, December 1st, January and May are terrific times to go out there and review your output reports because those are things that uh, either are very important to start the budgeting cycle or actual payments that you're going to get. Uh, it's also very important to make sure any of your claim data that you submitted makes it to our output reports and makes it to our data files by June 30th. Because if you submit something after June 30th, you might not get a current year payment, 
you will eventually get a payment if you submit it within that next year, but it could take several years to get those uh, aid payments to you. Part five, tips for ensuring aid is correct and timely. This is kind of our summary at the end to really wrap it up uh, to, to really kind of make sure that everything is uh, correct and, and timely and we pay it when you should get it and you're not delayed because we really don't want to delay payments. We don't want inaccurate payments. Our job is to you know, really produce the, the correct final product for you. So the bullets. First thing, submit SAMS claim forms in a timely manner and provide accurate data. In order for us to produce an accurate November 15th data file, we would really like to get everything to us close to November 2nd as possible or before. We realize that's not always possible, but the sooner the better so that we have time to check it at our end as well. Review SAM's edit reports. This is very important. Whenever you fill out a claim form and run the edit reports, we really need, if there's, if there's a, an edit kicking out, we go through every year and we really do try to make the edits useful, we try to get rid of any redundant edits, and we try to make them only, uh, if we have an edit, it's important to us for, for some reason. We do really go through each year and try to uh, make those not only important but necessary. And we look for substantive comments. Just saying that the data went up and it's correct isn't really a substantive comment and, and a lot of times we will contact you and and possibly not clean your forms until those edits are resolved. And uh, we are looking for for clear and and uh, substantive comments. Third item, submit documentation for building projects, leases, transportation contracts, bus purchases, bus and garage leases, as required by law and regulation. As Andrea pointed out in our deadlines calendar, you can go through that deadlines, and there's a lot of links, and it'll, it really lays out what we're expecting you to submit as documentation throughout the year and a lot of the links are pointing towards what's required by law and regulation. We also ask that you submit to the stack office the claim data that's important and timely. Uh, we also ask that you review and understand the data provided to you by other district personnel such as student with disability FTE enrollment data that's on the Form A, uh, beds data, enrollment data. It's very important that all that data be correct. I know business officials uh, in a lot of districts, because districts may either be big or they have their, the um, different subsystems in other offices, those that are provided to the, those information and data that's provided to the department that is outside of your um, area is very important to us and you should understand how that all works together to drive the state aid calculations. Periodically review the state aid calendar. I think Andrea said earlier, if you look at nothing else on the state aid website, that would be her you know, number one tip for you to do and, and it is important it's, it's a great resource. If you look at it once a month, you bring it up, what do I need to do for state aid purposes this month? And, and take a look at it. It's a great, great resource. Uh, quick explanation, has links to other offices and has contact information. It's a great resource. And the other area 
other thing that we ask you to do is look at go to the state aid homepage frequently, periodically, once a week, and check to see if we have any important notices out there. One thing I think I touched on a little bit earlier, communicate and coordinate with others in your district. It's important. I listed a few examples. Student with disability, FTE enrollment, free and reduced price lunch count, beds enrollment, transportation claim data. All that data is important and it may come from other offices and uh, please coordinate with those offices so the claim is accurate and complete. Another thing that sometimes is off the scope a little bit, but it's very important to go and click on the BOCES component output reports and understand what data is flowing through there. Uh, you want to look at the prior year and the estimated actual year expense. Try to go through and look at the um, actual detail on the report allocation of expenses and deductions a pair by service area on the component output report. If you have any questions with those reports, please feel free to ask us or ask the BOCES. Again, if you have any questions, we have several several aid areas in the office and uh, there's a few supervisors that are more than happy to answer your questions and walk you through any state aid calculations or point you to uh, reference material to help you out. And that concludes Bruce, thank you very much. five. Uh, at this time we have, uh, we have a couple minutes left in our session, so if anyone has any questions and would like to ask either Andrew or Bruce a question, please feel free to do so. You can hit the raise hand button if you are either on your phone or are using a computer hooked up with a microphone. Otherwise, you can use the text or uh, at use the ask question button. We'll give you 10, 15 seconds to go ahead and do that. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands or any questions. Bruce and Andrea, thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule to present for us today. And thank you to everyone on the uh, webinar for attending.